We're on part five of eight. Can you believe it? Uh, we're way past halfway. We're looking at how it all ends, which is basically what God concluded his revelation of himself to the world through his word with this amazing book of Revelation. And I already shared with you the three parts of both the Bible. And interestingly enough, Paul's gospel presentation in Acts 17 when he stood at Mars Hill and shared the gospel, he went through the creator, redeemer, judge. That was his you know, three-part message. It's also the outline of the book of Revelation. Jesus is introduced in chapter 1, how he is right now as the awesome, all-powerful creator of the universe. Then we look at the implications in chapter 2 and 3 of him being our redeemer. Remember that verse, for you were bought at a price, therefore what? Glorify God with your body. That's all chapter 2 and 3 is about. Jesus said, I'm so committed to you, I'm going to spend all of my time until the, the tribulation launches, all my time is going to be focused on making every one of you in my church fruitful, uh, doing what I designed you to do because I'm the redeemer of your life and that's why you're here. And then finally, the book of Revelation, the part everybody thinks about, the apocalyptic parts uh, in the apocalyptic use of the word of being like disastrous unfolding judgment, that's chapter 6 onward. Okay, Revelation 1, God wants us to see Jesus clearly each day as our creator. Um, I was sharing, I just want to show you Isaiah 46 for a second, because when I met with the staff, um, it, it was Isaiah 46, verses 3 and 4 that I read to them. And I said, listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been upheld by me from birth, who have been carried from the womb. You know, I'm not sure my mother ever told me the name of the attending physician when I was born at uh, Edward W. Sparrow Hospital in Lansing, Michigan, way back in 1956. But, you know, I'm sure he was a well-paid well obstetrician and did his job and came and went like I've seen them do uh, for all the births of our babies. But I've never seen him again, never, you know, no tie with him at all. But look what this says here. I have hold, I've held you from your birth. So it's actually not the obstetrician or the OBGYN nurse. It's God who catches us when we come into this world with all the uh, you know, vicissitudes and dangers of birth when we're so close to death at our birth because anything could go wrong. I've carried you from the womb. Remember he said to Jeremiah, I've known you. Uh, since your, your instant of conception. See, what's so interesting is our creator, he's not just distantly off somewhere when he flung all this into existence. He said, I'm quite a lot closer than that. I, I actually, verse 3, I have been keeping you going from your birth. I've been actually carrying you from the womb. Most people don't feel very carried. They feel like we have been pulling ourselves up by our straps. I'm the one that get up every day and works, and I've tried real hard. You know what I mean? We, we think of things so much from our perspective rather than God who wants us to see Jesus clearly in his role. He is the only one that's been with us the whole time. Now, I got the privilege of marrying Bonnie way back in 1983, because she was the one person in the whole world I would rather spend all of my time with. So if you want to know where everybody stacks up, I would rather spend all my time with her. So anything with anybody else is a sacrifice. And you know, that's, that's wonderful, and that's love and marriage and everything. God wants us to see Jesus is more interested in us than I am in Bonnie. Now, I would say I'm more interested in Bonnie than many of you uh, probably are in, in uh, people in your life. But God is most interested for us to know Jesus is the only one who's right there catching us, right there keeping us going, right there holding us. And look what it says in verse 4. Even to your old age I am he. Even to your gray hairs I will carry you. I have made you. I will bear you. I will carry you. I will deliver you little repetitious if you ask me. He could have just said, I'm there. 
But what he's saying is, I want to, and using the Hebraic way of emphasis by repetition and parallelism, he's saying, I am the one, I am your creator, I am the one that designed you, especially the unchangeable features of your life, and that's what chapter one's all about. So what we're going to do is, tomorrow, Lord willing, we'll jump into the implications of Jesus committed to make us useful. Revelation 2 contains the most sobering uh, passage about Jesus Christ operating in the church, and he says, there are some people in some churches that I weaken their bodies, I take away their health, I make them sick, and I even kill them because they won't be useful to me. That's called chastisement. Hebrews 12 calls it chastening and scourging. See, I think many Christians think that they're struggling through life because they didn't get enough education or they didn't pick a good job or because their parents didn't help them or they didn't marry right or you know what I mean or their company is downsizing. Actually, they're struggling through life because they're doing everything except being useful to God. And Jesus said, I will resist your life to the point of death if you don't let me fulfill my role as redeemer. So that's tomorrow. Chapter 4 on is God wants us to seek first his kingdom. And he says, I'm going to show you what it means to seek my kingdom. Chapter 4 on, the throne, as we talked about a couple days ago, is central. It just towers over chapter 4 on. And everything unfolds from the tranquility of the throne of God. And all you know, the sparkling lights and all of the flashing lightning and the peals of thunder and the flaming uh, seven archangels that always face God. I mean, everything. And the cherubim doing a theocentric orbit around that throne, all that stuff is to say, God's in charge. It's totally tranquil, peaceful, calm, and everything's under control as the world disintegrates. And so that's going to be exciting when we get to that. But remember, the first canon of textual interpretation is always to remember, what did this book of Revelation mean to the churches at the epicenter of the empire? Remember, there are more Roman buildings in Turkey than there are in Italy. We always think that the center of the Roman Empire is Italy and the city of Rome. No, 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 no. It was the center of the treasury, the curia, you know, the legal system and everything else. But the real world was right there. This is Roman province Asia. This is modern-day Turkey. And that edge that's facing the Aegean Sea in Greece was the epicenter of Roman culture, Roman power, Roman buildings. I mean, the most magnificent buildings are there that Rome constructed. Unbelievable construction. So those churches, what did this letter mean to them? And that's, that's basically the devotional method is what I teach all the students, 2,000 of them so far over the last five, our first term on the road. And, and I say to them, 60% of your grade will be you demonstrating that you can do what Word of Life or whatever ministry I'm serving in tells you to title every chapter. And I said, your lifelong goal should be to have personally gone through all 1,189 chapters of the Bible, and you have summarized what that chapter's about in a sentence. Did you know if you do that long enough that you can find... uh, just about anything you have ever found in the Bible because you have have given each chapter this little tag and your mind goes back to it and you have that supernatural gift that God offers of the spontaneous remembering of a previously learned scripture. Number two, you find the lessons. You note the lessons, the truths, the doctrines. And you, you find them, you write them down in your own words and you invest some time using resources to get more of the history, to get more of the languages, to get more of of the theological grid. But look at this. You look in the mirror and you check out whether or not you are conforming more and more to what that book says Jesus Christ wants us to look like. That's all of our goals every day. And so I'm going to do that with you. So I've typed it out. This is my journal uh, that... But I'm not showing you my handwriting because um, I have curious handwriting. I write all in capital letters and I print. 
you know, and it's very interesting. And when I do cursive, I mean, it looks like Syriac and the Peshitta, you know, in ancient literature. But here's Revelation 1. That's what we're doing today. In my title, the moment I typed this one, was Jesus Today. And then the next time I thought about it, it was the risen Christ today and forever. And then I got what, the one I showed you already, that I'm supposed to be seeing my creator clearly. You know, every time I study a chapter, it just seems a little bit more uh, wonderful and different. My summary is the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ, sits at the end of the Bible for many reasons. It's unique. It's the only book of the Bible God gave to Jesus to give to us. There's no other book like that. Did God give Galatians to Jesus to give to us? No. God gave the message of Galatians to the Apostle Paul because he was targeting an area just to the right of Roman Asia, the center part, Galatia, and, and it was targeting all the, the legalism and going back to Judaism. You know, you already know that about that. This is the only book of the Bible. The other 65 are not like this one. It's the only one that God the Father said, I want everyone in your church, Lord Jesus, my son, I want all of them to see you as you really are and to know your plan and to live like they believe it. So think of that. You have a book that God gave you via his son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. That should make us pause and think about why does God the Father set this book apart from all the other books? And maybe that's why Satan has gone into overdrive to use the book of Revelation to be confusing and divisive among churches. I mean, half of Christendom plus thinks you should stay away from it. I mean, look, the, the, did Martin Luther do a commentary on Revelation? Did Calvin do a commentary on Revelation? I mean, they stood at arm's length, the reformers. They couldn't figure out. I mean, yeah, they, they taught on it here and there, but they were, they were mystified by the book. Yet, yeah, do you know from history what we find? If you take the extant, the still uh, findable sermons from the first three centuries, you know, from 100, the, you know, the birth of the church from the apostles on, from 100 to 200, from 200 to 300, and 300 to 400. So the first three centuries of the church after the last apostle, it's called in church history the post apostolic fathers. Did you know, when you look at their sermons and, and take the manuscripts and cut out their scripture quotations, like you noticed, even this morning, I've quoted verses as I'm talking. I've mentioned verses. Through every sermon, I'm saying this, I'm saying that, I'm quoting verses. If you do that from the extant sermons of the post-apostolic fathers, do you know there's only one book of the Bible they quote every word of in their sermons. It's not Romans. It's not the Gospel by John, my favorite. Uh, it's not Genesis. It's not any Old Testament book. It's not the Psalms. What book is it? The book of Revelation. Every single verse of Revelation is quoted in the first three centuries of the post-apostolic captured sermons of pastors. Why? Why? because they preached on it all the time. They got it. This book is different. All 66 books were inspired. They're all God-breathed. They're all flawless. They're all inherently the Word of God. But Revelation is all that, plus something. There's something that God wanted to communicate and wants us to get. God the Father wants Christ Church to understand his plans. He wants us to live with a guidebook. He wants us to enter the last days. By the way, when... When are the last days? Seems like everything's last days. Ah, you're getting it. You know what the book of Hebrews says? God, who at sundry times and in divers' manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these, what? Last days spoken unto us. When are the last days? The last days started when Jesus Christ was here on earth and launched his church. So don't let people mock you and say, oh, you say everything is the last days. You go, you're listening. They are, because I didn't say that. Jesus did. I'll never forget when I was interviewed, I was uh, at the church uh, where Don Locke Sr. was my right-hand man. Actually, I feel I was his assistant because he trained me in how to be a pastor. But we were in Tulsa, and when I moved to Tulsa, 
Uh, I came from New England, went to Tulsa, and the local radio station had a, had a habit of interviewing all the new pastors in Tulsa. Tulsa is a city of about a, a million people, and they had this John Erling was the king of radio, kind of like uh, Larry King, you know, kind of like anybody that's a, like Drudge used to be on the radio. The, Erling was Tulsa's voice. And I didn't know that. I mean, I just moved from New England. And, and so I was unpacking my brown paper cartons of books, and I was trying to get them all on the shelf, and it was just a jumble. And this new secretary, I didn't even know, I said, yes, she said, there's a phone call for you. But she said, before you take it, I should warn you. She said, you're going to be live on radio, it's lunchtime, and almost everybody in Tulsa listens to this. I said, well, what is it? She said, it's John Erling. I said, I don't know who John Erling is. She said, <laughs> she said, he calls every pastor on their first day and asks them questions. I said, well, that's great. And I looked around and brushed aside the papers and grabbed, you know, my, the tool I needed. And I got the phone and I said, yeah, John Barnett here. He says, this is John Erling. And he says, uh, you have 60 seconds before the break. He says, I have four other pastors on the line and Tulsa's listening. And he said, we have been talking before you got on about the fact that nothing in the Bible is verifiable. In fact, we're not even sure any of those people around uh, before David. In fact, we're not even sure David was real historically. But uh, now he says, you have 45 seconds. He says, could you tell me? <laughs> I mean, you know, there's people that ask questions, and they never pause to let you answer anything. They just keep going. And he says, could you tell us before the break why you believe the Bible is true? I said, hey, I'd love to. I said, there's really only one reason why I believe the Bible is true, because Jesus believed it was. That took 12 seconds. <laughs> there was this long pause. He said, we will certainly be back to this new pastor after the break. He says, We've never had anybody answer like that. And for the next hour, and every one of the other pastors got off the phone because they were all the pastors of the United Whatever Church that doesn't believe the Bible anyway, and they didn't like this, and they didn't want to be on the same call with someone that actually believed the Bible is true. And this radio host came back and he said, he said, Jesus believed the Bible is true? I said, yeah, yeah. He said, what else did Jesus believe? I mean, it, it, we spent an hour talking about the fact that God the Father wants Christ Church to understand. God has given us a guidebook to enter the last days. We're in a cosmic battle. It's, raised since it's raged across the universe since before the Garden of Eden. Remember, the serpent came and interrupted things there. And we could summarize Revelation as God's map of the future to guide us into how to make wise and proper eternal investments with our lives, our time, our treasures, all the days we have on earth. So how do we do that? Well, number one, and we're going to just walk through Revelation. By the way, this is what I do constantly. This is how I study the Bible. Uh, this is how I teach the Bible. I have such a pile of journals. Uh, I do a little way every day, and I just open just like I did this morning. It was 5.30, and I was sitting out there in that beautiful, newly remodeled room they let us uh, stay in, and I read verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. Now, if you read the Bible like you read anything else in life, you don't instantly think that what you're reading means something other than what it says. Most of life, I mean, you read the menu and it says pancakes, whole wheat flour. You go, pancakes. Cakes. What could that mean? Pans flying around and cakes of, you know. No, it's pancakes. We know what those are. And, and whole wheat flour or buckwheat or whatever. So God, so the, the red part is my lesson, observation, principle, whatever. I find one for every little portion of Scripture, depending on how minute I want to go. One for a whole chapter, one for one verse, one for a phrase. For the first part of verse 1, which it says, to show his servants things which must shortly take place. I wrote God. Actually, I wrote me, because I write this to myself. I say, God gave me a map of the future. But because you're here, I changed it to you. 
God gave you a map of the future. Revelation is God giving to Jesus the map of the future for Jesus to share with his servants. So we will always know and operate in life understanding how we fit with God's plan for the future. That's really all we need to study about Revelation because that's what it's all about. Every part of it, every chapter, every ver- there are 404 verses, 800 plus allusions to other scriptures. All of it is to give us a map of the future because that's what God said it's about. Now remember yesterday I showed you this. I'll go through it real quick. Revelation is one of the few books in the Bible. It's so simple. It's chronological. It just flows. Every event just follows right through in a pattern that God gave. And it starts with us, the church on earth, and we're taken out of the earth, and we appear before the Bema seat of Christ. And we're in heaven, and we're worshiping while the, the judge of all, you know, drops the hammer of his wrath upon the earth. And he culminates all that with his second coming. I mean, we all know that. That's why I use the white arrow. He comes on a white horse, and, and on his thigh is written, you know, the king of kings and lord of lords. And, and Zechariah, see, you can fit in about one-fourth of all the Old Testament into that little section between chapter 6 and chapter 19, verse 21, because those are all the prophecies and predictions about what Jesus would do. But you know what Zechariah says? When he returns on that white horse with all the armies. In fact, uh, Matthew says, uh, when the Son of Man returns in his glory and all the holy angels are with him. It's the only time heaven gets emptied at the second coming. All the angels come, plus we come. In fact, the earliest prophecy was by Enoch. And Enoch, who lived back in Genesis 5, tells us in the book of Jude, Jude tells us that Enoch said, Behold, the Lord cometh with myriads of myriads of his saints. Actually, most Bibles say 10,000 times 10,000 because they couldn't imagine a number higher than 100 million. But what it's saying is a countless number of his saints. So all the saints, when I take people to um, Megiddo, you know, Armageddon, the hill of Megiddo, we always go out to that edge that's over the Israeli Air Force Base. They have this massive Air Force Base it's just a great prop for teaching, you know, this Israeli Air Force Base, because they're usually doing touch and goes with their F 15s and 16s and 35s. And they'll come, and oh, it just gets all the Holy Land pilgrims excited. They think Armageddon is sooner and sooner. But uh, when I stand there on the edge, I say, you know what? Look toward the north. I said, the armies of the earth are going to be gathered here. And one of the scouts is going to say, what is that dot? And there's going to be this dot. And then the dot is going to start fanning out, and it's going to widen and widen the closer it gets until it's just wider than you can comprehend because we know that there are hundreds of millions of angels, minimum, minimum. Because Daniel tells us that Thousands of thousands, a thousand times a thousand is, so it's millions, are standing. And 10,000 times 10,000 are, are in the periphery, in the background, and that's not counting all the saints. So however many saints there have been, you know, since the Garden of Eden on. And so we're talking about all the angels are in that, that V column coming with Jesus being the very center on that white horse. And he's coming And when he comes, Zechariah says that the eyes and tongues of all the armies at Armageddon melt. Oh, Did you know that's a description of what a neutron bomb does? Neutron bomb breaks down organic life, melts it. Doesn't hurt the buildings. It just destroys the organic life, the water-based life. Jesus kind of neutron bombs everybody at the second coming. And then what he does is he sets up his thousand-year rule, which hugely is described in the Old Testament. And then he lets out the devil after he confines him for a thousand years, and he causes a rebellion, and we go to the great white throne, and then it ends that we're dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. And that's why I love you know, John 14. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many, not Dolly Parton mansions, 
That's an unfortunate old English translation. In my house are many nests, actually. It's the same word that's used in Genesis 6 through 8, describing all the little cubicles in the ark. In the ark were many cubicles for Noah to put all those animals in. And in heaven are many cubicles for all of us to live in the same house with the Lord. We're all going to have our, our cubicle, our little space, however big space we need. And that, the Lord says, don't let your heart be troubled. In my Father's house are all those little spaces for you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when your cubicle's ready, I'm going to come find you. That's why I love it. There's the rapture, the group one. Then there's the personal one. Did you know that? Jesus comes to get either each one of us one at a time and take us to our cubicle, or that very first line there, the green one on the left, to get the group at the rapture. But there are two, two forms of rapture. Both of them have the same effect. Either we're taken to our room with just Jesus coming. That's why as a pastor I love doing funerals. I'd say, I know exactly where Jesus Christ was last night at 9.30. Everyone's saying, oh yeah, Bill died at 9.30 at you know, Ohio General. And you go, mm hmm that's one way you could put it. I put it this way. Jesus showed up at bed 703, you know, that, that room number 703 and that, that private occupancy room, and he stood by the bed, and Bill heard a voice that he immediately recognized and opened his eyes and for the first time saw the face of Jesus, and he said, your room's ready. The cruise is about to start. Are you ready to go? See, that's what all of us are going to experience. And finally, that's what Revelation ends in, that we dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Okay, let's keep going. We'll never get through Revelation. We're only on A of verse 1. Here's B. So I kept reading. Oh, let's get to Revelation 1, and look at what I found. What does it say in Revelation 1, the second part of verse 1? Which God gave him to show his what? What does it say? Show who? Say it out loud servants, to show his servants. You know what we're supposed to be? God's servants. Remember, there's hardly anything revealed in Revelation that's new or original. Rather, it's a systematic repetition. Revelation is the most unoriginal book in the Bible. It's, it's almost total rehash of everything else, but it just puts it together and illustrates it. It's kind of like a picture book. It's a systematic repetition of everything God the Father says we need to know to choose to live the rest of our lives as his servants. What was the plan Jesus had for his life? So turn back with me to Matthew 20. Okay, Matthew 20. And uh, we ought to have Bible drills, right? Do you remember Bible drills? Before we had electronic Bibles and it was people were poking them, they had to actually know the order of the books of the Bible. But chapter 20 of Matthew, verse 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to what? Serve. serve. And give his life a ransom for many. What was the plan Jesus had for his life? He said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve others. I don't want to be served. I want to serve. Now, that was also the operating system that Christ's greatest follower, named the Apostle Paul, I mean, I think almost everybody agrees that Paul accomplished more than anybody else has ever accomplished that we know of in the Bible for the Lord. I mean, he wrote half the New Testament. He is our spiritual great-great-granddaddy for most of us because he was the apostle to us, except for the few uh, Jewish believers we might have sprinkled in. The majority of us are downline from Paul. And he, he, in the New Testament, had an operating system you know what it is? Look at 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1. It's his testimony. So 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1. Let a man so consider us as, what's your Bible say? Servants of Christ. Now you've got one of the exciting things of scriptural interpretation. In English, what's the word? Servants. In Greek, there are eight, don't want my Bible to fall off there. There we go. There are eight different Greek words for servants. And they're all translated with one English word, servant. 
There are eight different kinds of New Testament servants. This one that's in 1 Corinthians 4.1 is what we would call the lowest of the eight kinds of servants. Here, let me just tell you some of them. One of them was called a therapon. That's, a, that's the Greek word for s- servant or slave, therapon. Now, that's come right into English. What does it sound like? Therapist, right? Do you ever go to your therapist? In the world of the Bible, a therapon, a therapist, was a slave. But they were really special slaves. The emperor had therapons that stood next to him that listened to what everybody said, and when they left, he says, could you put that in my journal? I didn't, you know, I wasn't even listening, but whatever. You know, they were the advisors. They, they were therapons. They were advisors, and everybody had therapons. And they advised them where to go to eat, and they made the arrangements that we would call them almost a personal secretary. Okay, so a therapon. Here's another one. There were liturgons. You know what those are? That's in Romans 12, 1 and 2, where it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living what? Yeah, it, that's liturgos was a slave that offered sacrifices for you. So you would go to the temple and you'd bring whatever, I'm talking about pagans, you bring whatever you're offering to whatever pagan deity, and you handed it to the liturgos, a slave. And all the slave did was take your offering and do whatever they did with it for the slave. You all know more of them. I mean, there's diakonos. That's an, a third type of slave. We have those in almost every church, you know, especially Baptist churches. They have lots of diakonoses. I love being a pastor, and you know, they'd all come introduce themselves, and they'd say, I'm a deacon. I said, ah, you're one of the ministering slaves here. I'm looking forward to working with you. And they, you know, what, was that supposed to be an insult, or is that a compliment? I said, no, that's what the Bible calls a deacon is a waiter, a ministering servant. That's what a diakonos was in the New Testament world. So I could go through all these, but do you know what this one is? This is the last one. In the Roman world, they had people that were like batteries that you have in a device, and it's like your your smoke alarm, and it starts chirping at you, and you don't like it, so you unscrew it, and you open the back. And what do you do with those batteries that are making it chirp, that have run out of juice? You collect them and put them on your shelf, and you put a frame around them. No, you throw them in the trash. You shouldn't. You should put them in a recycle place because they're so poisonous and everything. But we throw them away. And we put new ones in. That's what this word is. It's the word huper retes. Huper is the Greek preposition beneath, below, or under. And retes is the, the verb for rowing a boat. And so, well, let me show it to you. I have a picture of it. Did you ever watch uh, Ben-Hur and, and Charlton Heston and the galley slaves, you know, remember all that? Those men, you can see their knees, some of them, are holding telephone pole length pieces of wood that are out the side of what would be called a galley ship or the Romans called them triremes because if you notice there are three levels of seats so they had three levels of paddles tri three stories of paddlers now basically Paul's testimony is 1 Corinthians 4 1 he said let a man so consider us if you want to add up my life, if you want to figure out my life, I am a servant. I am a hupe retes of Jesus Christ. And he uses another word, another kind of minister, a steward, an oiko, uh, oiko, I don't remember the ending of that Greek word, but it was someone that worked around the house, kind of bought everything and put it on the shelves. They didn't serve, they just bought and put on the shelves. He said, I am the steward, but more than that, primarily, I am this. And this word, hupe retes, of Christ, by the way, it's used of the other greatest servant in the Bible, too. Who is called the man after God's own heart? Who did Jesus tell us that God wrote their tombstone and said, this man fulfilled my purpose in his life? His name was David. Paul and David are the only two people in the whole Bible that are called by this word, hupe retes. Because the Lord says, if you want to know the greatest Old Testament servant, the man that was after my own heart, that I named my son, the son of David, the man that broke all ten commandments, David, he murdered and committed adultery and lied and broke the Sabbath day and defamed the name of the Lord and coveted 
Bathsheba more than, you know what I mean, he broke all ten commandments. Both Paul and David, God's two greatest servants, are described by God because the words of the New Testament were chosen by the Holy Spirit. That's what God breathed means. Yeah, God used the 40 humans, but he breathed through them the words. They are the very pure word of God, as Proverbs says. So what was an under rower? Simple observations. Bonnie and I last October were standing on the actual pathway that they just excavated between the Aegean Sea and the Corinthian Gulf, and that was called the Diolkos. It's where, they, where these guys dragged the boats when they were coming. You could go across the Isthmus of Corinth, and it just took a few hours to drag a boat about a mile or two, uh, and you saved days of sailing. So this word was really well known to the Corinthians because they saw these people dragging their boats. These people, the, the Hupiretes, rode to the captain's beat. See all those paddles? How would you know when to do your paddling? You know, kind of like a lot of churches, everybody's paddling on their own, and that's why the boat's going around and around and around, you know, because most people don't like to be told what to do. Paul said, I love to be told what to do. I am submissive. I, I row to the captain's beat. Basically, the captain stood up at the front, and he had this big mallet, and he went, boom, boom. Watch Ben-Hur, you'll see it, okay? Boom, boom, and they pulled but those paddles were so big you couldn't pull alone. You had to pull together. You had to say, okay, guys, we're all chained here and everything. We've got to do this. You ready? Boom. So Paul said, I have a submissive life. I'm rowing the captain's feet. I have a sensitive life. I realize that I can't do this alone. I have to do it in conjunction with all the other members of the body of Christ. We are builded together into this spiritual body. And so I'm going to be sensitive to those around me. I'm not going to be the lone ranger. I'm going to be a huperetes. I'm going to do what my captain tells me to do. So I submit my life. And I'm so human, I have to resubmit it every day. And I'm going to be sensitive to those around me. And by the way, if you were down there and you were all closed in, you had to trust the captain. You didn't know why he was boom, boom, boom. It could be if he was going boom, 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 he was water skiing, or you were about to be rammed by an enemy and you know, killed. So you just were in the dark about where your life was going, and you trusted the captain. Now, doesn't that describe how Paul made it through all those prisons and everything else that Paul went through? He said, hey, I I'm... I'm submissive to the captain. He's the one that's, I'm seeking first his rule in my life. And I am sensitive. That's where all those love one another and submit to one another and pray for one another, you know, all the one another's that we always have messages about. It's, it's being sensitive to one another. I'm trusting. The captain knows where we are. He knows where we're going. He knows when we're going to get there. I mean, do you remember ever having your kids in the car? As soon as you turn the car on, where are we going? And as soon as you put it in gear, when are we going to get there? I mean, I would hear it from the car seats all over the car. They just, that's how humans are. We're, we want to know everything. And you know what Paul says? I don't know exactly where I am. I just know I'm on this course, and I'm going to finish it. And when I finish it, the righteous judge on that day will give me this crown. And not to me only, but to everybody else. It was submissive and sensitive and trusting. And by the way, those guys were all chained to the boat. They were like batteries, double A's. And when you wouldn't pull your oar, they just undid the chains, overboard, shark food. They were disposable slaves. That's why they're the lowest. There are eight kinds of slaves. These guys were the lowest of the slaves. And so Paul says, I'm dedicated for life. And by the way, number five, if a hupe retes was doing what he was supposed to do. Rowing, no one ever saw him. If a hupe retes was in sight, he wasn't doing his job. Did you know that would solve so much of what goes on in Christendom? Everybody wants to be on the deck. Everybody wants to be pounding the, you know, the drum for when everyone's supposed to beat. Nobody, what was that song? Too many chiefs and not enough Indians in this house of mine. 
that's a no longer proper song, but it captures the problem of Christendom. That we are supposed to be like the greatest servants. We're supposed to say, my life is about rowing to the captain's feet. I'm going to row together with all the other believers. I'm going to trust the captain about why we're going where we're going, when we're going to get there, you know, when I'm going to get fed, when I'm going to get my water. That's what the, the Hupe Rete is worried about. And by the way, I'm in it for life. It's not like I can't wait to get that shackle off me. I've read the end. We're still his bond servants in heaven. See, this isn't something like we've got to get through it and learn this submission. It's, it's who we are in Christ. And when we're working, we're never seen, which is humility. So the question is, how do I please the Lord? By making the daily choice to serve God that way. Submissively, sensitively, trustingly, in a dedicated manner, humbly, before our God. Let's see if we can get out of verse 1. Oh, I found another observation in verse 3, and we have four minutes. So I'm sitting there, and I'm reading verse 3. Look, look at, back to Revelation, chapter 1, verse 3. Do you see why Revelation takes 20 hours in the Bible Institute to go through? Um, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. What's the very first word of verse 3? What is it? Blessed, yeah. How to live the best life possible. God wants each of us to know that his pathway for us is simply this. Read, hear what I'm saying, and keep it. Okay? Three things. Reads means direct exposure to God's message so we can know what God has revealed for us. That means getting our own copy of the Word of God before us and personally studying it. Nothing should be secondhand. I mean, they didn't even take what Paul said in Berea right off the cuff. They, they said, wait a minute, great message, Paul. We're going to go, the Bereans, remember, uh, in Acts 17, 11. They went home and took their own copy and made sure that what he said squared with God's word. Here's, remember, it says those who read, those who hear, and those who keep are blessed. Here's means the goal was to block out any other voice or activity or event and tune into listening to God's message. It's like putting on your headphones. You ever meet someone like that? They smile at you, they're at the coffee shop, you're trying to talk to them, or they're on the airplane or the bus or wherever you are, and then all of a sudden they go, or, you know, those, I love those giant ones people put on. What are they doing? They're tuning out everything but one sound at a time for their brains to process. The key is to focus on God's message every day until you get it. And I've already talked to you about, you know, one of my heroes, George Mueller, of Bristol. I talked to you about, you know, uh, C.T. Studd. Hudson Taylor is another one of my heroes. In fact, I named our kids, uh, uh, Bonnie and I, we prayed about one of our children. We named him Joseph David Hudson Taylor Barnett. How do you like that monogram? J-D-H-T-B. You know, it sounds like a corporation, but it was to remember that man, Hudson Taylor. Do you know how he established the largest mission to the largest people group on earth? He got missionaries, 1,200 of them, 100 in every one of the 12 provinces of China, and he did it through the Boxer Rebellion and through all the things that went on and all the horrors, the opium trade, and all the demonism and everything else and the dangers. How did he do that? He got up every morning. His journal says that he clicked the flint, made the spark, lit the, the little bit of starter, blew it until he could get a flame, and he lit his candle, and he opened up, now he was way ahead of us, he opened up his Greek New Testament and his Hebrew Old Testament, and with a paper in between and his quill, he studied the Greek and the Hebrew, and he wrote out his day's messages, and in most of those caravansaries that he stayed in in China with all the bed bugs and everything else, if you ever read about it, he would start that at 4 a.m., so he would have enough studied to preach all day long. I like better just saying, pop in the earbuds. I don't know about all that other stuff. It was too hard. But we need to focus on God's message until we get one. Not just read it real quick and get it over with, check it off, I did it. Keep going to hear from God. And it doesn't stop there. 
The best life possible has a final component. We come to the word keep. That's when we go from merely being a hearer but a doer. That word means to guard like a treasure, some part of what we found. We've got to keep it. And, and that word keep is the same word that's used for when they put the apostles in jail in Acts chapter 12. It's the same word that's used in, in Matthew 28 when the, the guards were keeping watch of Christ's tomb in the garden. It's, it's guarding it, not letting anything happen to it. Do you get something out of God's word and you are bound and determined that you're going to hold on to that all day long and and keep prayerfully yielding and saying, God, that's what I want you to do in my life. That's the best life possible. That's the life that God blesses. And when we realize God's word's different than anything else, it's not common, it's not regular, it's not temporary, it's a treasure that we're going to hold on and stick to it. And Oh man, it's 1030, so let me just show you the rest of them. Here's my fourth one. It was to all believers then and now. That's why it's plural. Verse 5 says, we're, we're loved, loosed, and washed. Uh, and I was going to talk to you about variants because that's, that's a very beautiful variant in the Greek manuscript. Verse 5, there is a sigma, which is a, an S. It's like a little circle with a bump on the right-hand side of it. And that's the only difference between the NIV, the NAS, the ESV, and the King James, and the New King James, the two manuscript families. It's just a little S is in there. And when you don't have the S, it means that he loved us and loosed us from our sin. But if you have the S in there, so means loved us and washed us from our sin. And do you know what? Both are true. So that's an interesting variant. And then the next one, forever we offer worship. It says in verse 6 that we're a kingdom of priests. And my seventh uh, observation I made is in verse 8. And Jesus is the Alpha and Omega and the, the Almighty, and it's the beginning of what I told you, that all these attributes start showing up. In the book of Revelation, all 25 divine attributes are attributed to Christ. It's an amazing book. He's all-powerful, he's all-knowing, he's all-present, he's all-loving. And so if we'd have had time, I would have said, how do you apply this? And I would say that nothing gets to us that God didn't know about in advance. You know, everybody thinks they're exception, that in my life, when I got pancreatic cancer, the Lord was not watching and just slipped up on him. Instead of saying, "Uh uh-uh, nothing gets to us that God didn't know about in advance as being best for us. That's what omniscience means. And nothing gets to us that God didn't allow as being best for us because he's all-powerful, and he would have blocked it. I mean, if you think on Star Wars, the force field can keep out the, the attacks. Can you imagine what God can really do? And nothing gets to us that God didn't plan as being best, because he's all-loving, he's faithful and gracious, and nothing gets to us that God didn't stay right there with us during its arrival and impact. That's what his omnipresence is. He doesn't say, hey, I hope you make it through it. He says, hey, I'm with you. Remember how we started in Isaiah 46? Yea, I have held thee from birth. I have, I have upheld thee. I am holding you to your, to your gray hair. I am still holding you, and I will uphold you. And he just keeps saying that. So if we had enough time, I would remind you of what the 25 attributes are that you've already seen. And I'd remind you that these four prime ones, everyone knows, omnipresence, omniscience, love, and omnipotence. And then I would say that the goal of Revelation, chapter 1, is learning to apply the attributes of God to my fears, to my troubles, to my struggles, and start seeing everything that happens in life from his perspective. And I would have closed with this. We're supposed to trust God with our life's fears and struggles, like financial hits. Oh, if I'd only known, I would have sold my, you know, General Electric or IBM stock before it tanked, and I would have bought that dumb Google and Apple stuff, you know, or Amazon, you know, if I'd only known, but I took a financial hit, and my whole retirement pension was in General Electric, and, and I could have had the house behind the walls instead of the double wide, you know, if I'd have just, hey, God actually is a better investment advisor, and, and wealth, God says, is dangerous, because you don't need me as much the more you have. Or, that accident, I mean, I should have never taken that road. I should have never driven, you know, whatever. Wait a minute. Are there really accidents with an omniscient, omnipresent, 
God, who's all-powerful. Or, you know, the unexpected loss of whatever job or security, and boy, talk about this one. <laughs> Where was God? You know, whatever. So this is basically what he says. We're supposed to be trusting him. He's good. That means he always loves us. He's omniscient. He always knows everything before it happens. He's so powerful. Uh, I mean, he's always present with us in the box, and he's so powerful, nothing could get in the box. But this is, this is what we need to learn. Our responses to our problems and fears and struggles is a declaration to the world. Do you remember when David sinned with Bathsheba? What did Nathan point at him and say? You have caused the enemies of the Lord. Your response to your struggle with your desires was a declaration to the watching world. Look at this. Either God is good or he's bad. David, either God is good, he gave you everything, would have given you more, or you don't think God knows what he's doing, so God's bad and you're going to go get what you want. See, all sin comes down to a lack of faith in the character of God. And God is either wise or he's dumb. He's either all-powerful or he's weak. And he's either everywhere present or he's absent. And every one of our responses are a declaration of that. So trusting God means nothing accidentally happens to us because he's good and always loves. He's omniscient and always knows. He's omnipotent and he's always powerful. And he's always with us. And uh, I could keep going, but I... I only can presume on your patience so long. So this is what I'd say to you. The book of Revelation is the last book because God wanted to summarize the entire Bible and put it into a form that even people living on the run, being hunted, uh, being mauled and eaten by wild beasts, being burned alive and everything else, that they could capture a message. And they didn't have to have five Greek concordances and Hebrew whatevers. And they could trust God, who is putting them going through life in this vehicle where it's impervious. Nothing can get into that vehicle except what God knows is best, what God plans is best, what God in his omnipotence allows to come in. And God says, I'm riding through life in that vehicle with you. And that's why the early church loved this book. By the way, in the first chapter, I found 36 of these lessons what one am I on? My next one is 11a. There's 25 more of them. That's in the first chapter. Um, but I encourage you. It's my favorite book, and it can be the most life-transforming book you've ever read. If you read it slowly, finding those lessons, and then prayerfully, and I'm trying to get, I'll just have to go escape. I want to get to the prayer. Come on. Let me go all the way down here and get to the prayer. Prayer. There it is. Boom. Play on Mac. This was my prayer, and I'll pray it with you this morning. Lord, I want to know and follow your plan. Help me to read and hear what you're saying and keep what you want me to keep. You loved and loosed and washed me. You're the Almighty. And if we'd have gotten to the next verse, Sunday is your day, because he was in the Spirit on Sunday. And as you walk around your church, like we see you in chapter 2 and 3, may you find me healthy. Use your sword in my life to keep me useful and pure. For Jesus' sake.